I want to work through about three pages and allude to a couple more pages in a chapter of a book that I encountered a while back by G.B. Caird. Some of you have uh, taken New Testament theology where we read his New Testament theology book. Uh, prior to writing that by a bit, he wrote a book called The Language and Imagery of the Bible. Uh, a big part of that book focused on how do we understand eschatological language uh, in Scripture? How, what do we do with texts that, that have prophetic, uh, predictive uh, components, but also use symbolic language, etc.? So he wrote this book, and it was a tremendously important book for me at the time when I read it, and uh, the most important chapter in my mind was chapter 2 called The Meaning of Meaning. What does it mean when we say this text means blank, blank, blank? Uh, we often use words like that as if, well, everybody knows what the sentence means, so we just go with it. Well, Caird is particularly good at focusing the question by making distinctions and saying, okay, do you mean this or do you mean this? And when you stop and think about it, you realize that often the questions that we ask are really fairly ambiguous. And so depending on whether the person we're talking to thinks we're answering question A or question B, they're going to misinterpret or disagree or agree with our answer when we're actually quite talking past each other. So it's a little bit technical, but it's also a little bit fun at places. I hope you can follow it. I'm going to also be uploading the pages that I'm working off of so you can read them there but uh, also want to work through it uh, in a little bit of detail. So the chapter is called The Meaning of Meaning, starts on page 37 of The Language and Imagery of the Bible by George Caird. Let me read a little. Before we ask what the Bible means, it is essential that we ask ourselves what we mean by the word means. For meaning is a highly ambiguous term and the only safe way of handling it is to identify by indexing the various senses in which it is commonly used. So, uh, the previous chapter already started that process, so he's now going to refer to what he's already talked about. We have already made a good start in the previous chapter by the vital distinguish distinction between meaning, now he uses superscripts, meaning R and meaning S. So these two are, when you ask about meaning, you might be asking about the referent, to whom is a word or a sentence referring, or you might be asking about the sense. What exactly does that mean? So for example, if, I, if somebody says, uh, makes a reference to the teacher of this class, and you say, what do you mean? Or if you say, who do you mean, or whom do you mean? Well, those are two very different questions. One of them is a question of meaning, like, what do you mean? Well, the person who sets up the Zoom calls, the person who makes the videos. So, what you mean by the question, who is the teacher, is different from whom you mean, who you're referring to. Who is the teacher? Well, it's Tim Geddert. So, the referent of your question, or your comment, or your word, or your sentence, isn't necessarily the same as the sense, the, the meaning of the words. Okay? So, in the previous chapter, he made that distinction. So, there's an important distinction between referent and sense, between what is being spoken about and what is being said about it. So, the referent is the person to whom you refer. That's who is being spoken about. But the sense is what you're saying about that person. You're making a claim. You're adding content to the person to whom you refer. To these, we must shortly add a third legitimate partner. So he's going to say meaning has to do with reference, it has to do with sense, and it has to do with... But he doesn't want to get to it yet. He wants to first deal with the intruders. So there's a third legitimate thing we might actually be paying attention to when we talk about meaning. But before we get to that one, he's going to talk about the intruders. Let's begin with meaning, and then the superscript V, meaning V. V stands for value. Okay? 
consider this statement. The fourth gospel means more to me than all the letters of Paul. If somebody said that, what would they mean? This does not necessarily imply a greater understanding of the one than the other. If John means more to me than Paul, that doesn't mean that I understand John so much better and therefore there's more meaning in my mind when I consider the two. No, it doesn't imply greater understanding. It's an expression of preference, which might even be made by someone who in fact understands Paul better than John. Sometimes you prefer a text precisely because you misunderstand it. So meaning V, that is value, often threatens to usurp the throne which properly belongs to meaning S. We think we're talking about the sense of something, but in fact we're talking about the value. And its spurious claims attract two ill-sorted classes of adherents. The very devout, whom it encourages to concentrate on what moves them deeply, in other words, if all I'm thinking about is meaning V, this is the value that I put on it, then we think that we really catch the meaning when in fact all we do is allow the text to deeply impact us. It has nothing to do with whether you did or didn't understand the text. So people concentrate on what moves them instead of listening to what the Bible actually says. If we're pursuing meaning, it's quite a different thing to ask, how much does this mean to you, and what does it actually mean? Meaning V and meaning S are quite different things. So one of the groups of people that it attracts are the deeply religious, who concentrate on what moves them deeply. But another one is the mildly religious, who rise up in defense of familiar cadences whenever a modern translation of the Bible is brought to their notice. All right. For example, if you have a favorite Bible and it's always worded your favorite text a certain way and some new translation comes along and says it differently, it's precisely your valuing the text that makes you want to stick with the old translation. It has very little to do with what the text means. It has to do with what it means to you. Value, not what it means. That's a question of what were authors actually trying to communicate. Now, a more subtle hazard is presented by another sense of the word meaning, and that's what we call entailment. A entails B. We'll explain that in a minute. So, meaning E. Okay, We've already got meaning S, sense, meaning R, referent. Those are legitimate ways of thinking about meaning. Meaning value is a perfectly legitimate thing to have, but it's not what we're talking about when we want to understand the meaning of a text. We're not asking, do you value this text? The other thing we're not asking is entailment, so meaning E. If I were to say, so this is now cared using an image, if I were to say nationalism means war, I am not asking anybody to believe that the two words are interchangeable synonyms but rather that the one phenomenon leads inexorably to the other. Too much nationalism, it's going to lead to war. When the author of Hebrews says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering, he's not telling us that Jesus learned how to obey. And certainly not that he learned what the dictionary definition of the word obedience means. Rather, he's saying he learned what obedience entails. It's going to bring with it suffering. The world being what it is, obedience for him meant suffering. Meant. That's meaning E, entailment. Meaning E sets a trap into which theologians are prone to fall. To fall. Many volumes have been written, for example, about justification by faith, whose authors, ignoring the fact that justify means 
to declare or prove someone to be in the right, have tried to pack into the meaning, S, of the word, all that is entailed for faith and conduct in being justified by God. I'm going to leave that image for now. What he's claiming is, we try to put into the meaning of the word, justification, everything that's entailed by the fact that we are justified by faith. The example that I've used in other places is the word cross or cross-bearing. What does it mean to bear the cross? Well, that's a pretty ambiguous question. One question could be, when Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We could ask, what did Jesus mean? What's the meaning of the sentence? What's the sense of what he said? Or we could ask about the reference. To what was he referring? Was he referring to suffering? Was he referring to martyrdom? Was he referring to obedience? But we could also the question, answer the question of entailment. Those who take up the cross, now finish the sentence. They are likely to do this. They are required to do this. They are, that's what's entailed by cross-bearing. But the three different answers are in fact three different answers. The question of sense or reference or entailment are answered very differently. If we want to in fact understand authors, we might need to pay attention to all three of them, but we better at least know which question we think we're trying to answer, or we're certainly going to talk right past each other. Now he gets to a good example. So, uh, after this cautionary digression, we return to the main highway. In other words, when we're talking about meaning, let's make sure that we don't inadvertently get to value. And let's make sure that we don't inadvertently get to entailment when we think we're actually talking about sense and reference. When we're talking about what does the sentence actually mean. Now, he's going to refer to a French scholar by the name of Saussure who makes a distinction between language and speech. In other words, language is the, the, the set of tools that people, that cultures use in order to communicate, but speech is what a particular person chooses to do with that language. In French it would be la langue and la parole. Pardon my French. So the modern science of linguistics basically was given birth by this distinction that Saussure made. By language, Saussure meant the whole stock of words, idioms, and syntax available, the potential, the common property of all users. That's language. By speech, he meant any particular and actual use of a language by a particular speaker or writer. So there's language, that's what we share. There's speech, that's what somebody does with it. Now, this is obviously very relevant to the question of meaning. What does something mean in the objective sense of what would we normally analyze the language of this culture to imply by such words. But you could ask a separate question, what did the speaker mean to say? Those two are not necessarily always going to be the same. So let me continue with Carrie. Some scholars have suggested that there is need for an intermediate term. Now, if you studied linguistics, you'd know some of these terms. I have studied it only a very little, and I won't go into the details. And that's idiolect or lexis to designate the range of language within the competence and command of each individual user. So there's language, what the culture has created, invented, what's evolved, what's developed. Then there's my mastery of that language, what I tend to do with it. The words in that language that I in fact know, uh, the, the, the ways in which I get the language usage correct or incorrect, that's my own idiolect, that's my personal dialect, if you wish. And then there's any particular speech, act. Before Saussure made this point, it was already made less scientifically but more imaginatively by Lewis Carroll. So let me read a little bit from Alice in Wonderland. That's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory, Alice said. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I meant, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. 
But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, says it, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be the master? That's all. Then, having explained the meaning of impenetrability, Humpty Dumpty goes on. When I make a word do a lot of work like that, I always pay it extra. All right. So much for Alice in Wonderland. Our sympathies are enlisted on both sides, since each is standing for a valid principle. Alice, somewhat pedantically, maintaining the intractability of language. In other words, it means what it means. You can't do that. And Humpty Dumpty, somewhat cavalierly, asserting his mastery over speech. Notice the difference. Alice is thinking about language. Humpty Dumpty is thinking about speech. This is what the language is capable of communicating, what it's designed to communicate. Or this is what I am choosing to say, however oddly I choose to use language in the process. In our attempt to analyze the meaning of meaning, we shall have to discriminate between the public meaning, which is characteristic of language, and the user's user's meaning, which is characteristic of speech. One of the obvious differences between language and speech is that language consists of words along with the syntax that holds them together, whereas speech consists of sentences. I might want to word that just slightly different than care does. Language has rules about how you ought to put words together and what kind of syntax should produce particular meaning Whereas speakers, they create any sentence they wish, whether they do or don't follow the rules, whether they do or don't pay attention to what, speaker, what listeners might think they mean based on the common conventions of the language. We need, therefore, one definition of meaning, S, sense, for words, and another for sentences. The meaning, S, sense, of a word is the contribution it is capable of making to any sentence in which it stands, and the meaning S of a sentence is what the speaker intends to convey by it. So I hope you can tell when I'm digressing. I'm not attributing everything to cared. But there's a reason why we have words in a dictionary but not sentences. Words typically have particular meanings. This is what a culture has agreed that these words are going to be considered to mean. That's the sense of a word. But when speakers put words together in a particular way, they're creating a particular way, of a particular speech act. They're saying something which, in fact, has then their meaning. And I can only discern their speaker's meaning if I assume that they're using the words in approximately the way the dictionaries have encouraged us to think that these words are going to be used. Here, then, is the promised third partner. So we had sense and reference. He got rid of a few intruders, like value and entailment. And now he's going to go with the third. And this is the really crucial point of this whole conversation. And that's I, meaning I, intention. What does a speaker intend when they create a sentence? So here, then, is the promised third partner, meaning I, intention. In the firm, this partner has three functions, two of which very nearly coincide with those of the other partners. The sense and the referent of any act of speech are those which the speaker intends. In other words, intention goes along with sense and reference, because if I use the word knockdown argument, then I mean what I mean by that. And if I mean what a dictionary encourages people in that culture to understand it to mean, then I'm going to communicate effectively to them because I'm following the rules of the language when I create my speech. So if my intention follows conventions, then my sense is clear. If my intention is to make reference to a particular person or thing, and I do a good job of it in the sentence that I create, then my referent is discernible from my sentence because my intentions were made clear. So intention works together with sense and reference. The third function 
however. Of any act of, sorry, the third function is connected with the uses of language enumerated in the previous chapter. Does the speaker intend what he says to be referential, commissive, or merely social? Okay, we didn't read the previous chapter, but he's going to give us a little bit of help with that. The answer to what did he mean might be he meant for you to leave or he meant to make you angry. But neither answer would necessarily give you a clue as to what the speaker actually said. To understand why a speaker says what he does is not the same thing as to understand what he is saying. So the intention of an author might be to get you to do something, to get you to feel something, to get you to think something, which may in fact be effectively accomplished by the referent and the sense, but is different from both. Because it's not what you say, it's the goal of what you say. The, this emphasis on intention raises a question whether there is not yet a further type of meaning which we have overlooked. Hearer's meaning. Okay, here we're getting to a really important question. Does a sentence mean what the author meant to say, or does a sentence mean what the hearer understands the sentence to say? Is the meaning in the text or the author behind the text, or the reader and hearer in front of the text. We are not at this point concerned with the obvious fact that in speaking, each of us involuntarily gives away information. We do that. He gives an example from the Bible. As the Ephraimites gave themselves away to the enemy by their inability to pronounce shibboleth. This is a story from Judges 12.6. And as Peter's accent betrayed his Galilean origin, according to Matthew 26. Surely you are one of them because your voice, your speech gives you away as a Galilean. That's not what Peter was trying to communicate, but it in fact was communicated by his speech act. So hearers, in fact, will hear things that speakers didn't intend to say. That's not what he wants to get at. He wants to get at the meaning is there a hearer's meaning in the sense and reference, and not only in the additional information that sometimes comes through? Let's get out of the sun, sun here for just a minute. Okay, I'm almost done. Nor are we concerned about the equally obvious and important fact that there are qualifications for accurate hearing. A hearer must know the speaker's language, both literally and figuratively, and he must in many instances have that commitment to self-involvement without which most commissive utterances are unintelligible. What does concern us is that words have associations of memory and experience which differ for different people. Everybody knows how hard it is to be sure that what is received is exactly what is transmitted without interference or distortion. So when people speak or when we read, we might be hearing things an author didn't intend to tell us, and it's going to be because of my own disposition, my own angle of vision, my good or bad experiences with the subject matter. Now here's the most important sentence that this has all been leading to. That people habitually attach a meaning of their own to what they hear or read is beyond doubt. We do that. But it does not follow that this kind of hearer's meaning is in any sense a part of the meaning of what was spoken or written. The purpose of speech is communication, and when user's meaning and hearer's meaning do not coincide, this is nothing more or less than a failure of understanding, a breakdown in communication. Caird is making the important point that when there is a speech, when there is a sentence written, there is a speaker and an author who are intending to communicate something in particular to the hearer and the reader. When that which they hear coincides with that which he intended for them to hear, there's been good communication. It's been effective. He, he said what he wanted to say and they got it. But when they attach to a sentence a meaning that he never intended, we shouldn't think of this as somehow a greater depth of meaning. We should consider it a breakdown in communication. 
That's the main point that I wanted to communicate from this chapter. There's actually another point that I think I'm going to briefly summarize. But this is the point that I think we need to spend some time thinking about, talking about, and drawing conclusions about. When we read the scriptures, is it or is it not the goal to hear what the author intended to communicate? Do we as readers have any right to attach to a text a meaning that's shaped by my experiences, by my preferences, by my sense of what's entailed by a sentence, my own misunderstanding of words or syntax perhaps, creates in me a meaning for this particular utterance that wasn't what the author intended it to be. Of course that happens. Inevitably, it sometimes happens. But shouldn't the goal be to make it happen as little as possible? To get the wrong meaning as seldom as we can possibly make it happen? To understand what the author intended to say as often as possible. Good communication means the author did a good job of using the language to create an utterance that the hearer correctly perceives. Now, all of that assumes that the meaning of the human author is the meaning that we're supposed to be discerning. And I think that should always be the starting point. If we want to ask the second question, and how does God, by the Spirit, choose to use this text to speak to me today beyond what the original author said? Do we just start all over again and say, well, now we have a second author, and the second author also has a sense and a reference and an intention, and it might be different from the human author, so let's just do the work of interpreting texts as if we now have a new author. Or do we start with the assumption that God has chosen to have us listen in on an ancient conversation, understand it, so that God's Spirit can help us to discern how to apply it in our world. So I'm going to leave for now the other issue that I was thinking of addressing, and that is where he talks about eschatology and what sentences and words mean when they're also predictive. But we'll come back to that in another place.